Now it's going to start to get uh, fun. So in this episode of this uh, video series on general theory of general intelligence, I'm going to start to get into some of the particulars of how I think we can actually build an AGI system you know, on computers that we have, have today by implementing the right algorithms. And there's actually going to be two videos that, that go over this, this nitty gritty stuff. So in, in, in this video, first of all, I'm, I'm going to talk about some computer science, the algorithm and, and data structure matters, uh, explaining how you can create algorithms that have the same general sort of format and, and intent and structure as unrealistically expensive, super powerful AGI systems. But where you can actually implement them on, on real computers. And I'll go through a series of steps showing how by introducing further and further simplifying assumptions, you can get things to be more and more practically feasible. And in the next video, af after this one, I'll talk more about some of the specific biases and habits and patterns that come from being a human-like intelligence and, and, and show how by, by assuming more human likeness, you can sort of simplify and scale down the problem of building AGS systems yet further. And I'll also introduce some, some math formalisms that sum up some of this human likeness. But uh, this, this uh, video, the material here is a bit mathy and computer science-y. And uh, I mean, I'm gonna be going lightly uh, as often in this series over a bunch of, of complex things. You'll have to dig into the papers that the talk is based on to re really understand the details, but uh, you know, I'll, 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 I'll do the best I can. Let me, let me share the screen here. So what I'm going to talk about is basically specializing maximally general AGI by a, uh, series of mathematical and conceptual steps beginning with something called discrete decision systems. A discrete decision system in general is something very, very abstract and, and very boring, but I think it's a, it's a critical building block in assembling practical AGI systems, as well as a way of thinking about some un unrealistic impractical AGI systems also. So discrete decision system, basically you have a system in a certain state based on what state it's in, it has a palette of actions it can choose from. It chooses an action based on its state. Each action that it chooses you know, influences the world in, in, in a way that, that brings it some reward or incurs some cost. And as a result of each action that the system takes, its state transitions, it goes into a new state. Based on the new state, there's a new palette of feasible actions available. And I mean, this, this high level view of decision systems, I mean, this encompasses say in AXETL or a, or a, a Gordel machine, if you define things, things correctly, the issue there is that the list of possible actions is very, 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 very large. And then the, the evaluation of the estimated the reward or cost of each action is 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 very very complicated, but th th this formalism also encompasses a lot of more realistic stuff. So I mean, as one among many many examples, I mean that this slide shows how you could you could formulate the process of spreading attention through a distributed network in in in, in terms of a discrete decision system, which. Uh, ECAN, Economic Attention Networks, is, is, is the way that attention values spread through an, an open cog system. I mean, this is just one example of activation spreading in, 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 in distributed networks in, in an AI system. In, in open cog, every element in the system's knowledge metagraph 
has a short-term importance value that tells you, tells how important it is for the system to process that thing in the near term and a long-term importance value that tells vaguely how important it is to keep that that node or link in the knowledge graph in, in RAM. And these short and long-term importance values spread through the knowledge graph. So if a certain node is important, it'll spread some importance to the other nodes that, that it's linked to, for example. So in this case, this is a discrete decision system of a quite simple kind, right? I mean, the state is a distribution of short and long-term importance values across the, the nodes and links in the, the knowledge graph of the system. The open cogs knowledge metagraph is called an atom space. The nodes and links are atoms. So the initial state is a distribution of short-term and long-term importance values across the atoms in, in, in the atom space. The actions involved here are spreading some importance, some short or long-term importance from one node to another in, in, in the atom space. And the the cost or, or, or reward is basically, you know, how much does how much does that spreading cause the distribution of importance values to represent the actual importance to the system? So if you if you spread short-term importance to some other node, and that node is actually something the system should be paying more attention to right now or in the near future, you know, then there, then there's some some reward to be to be delivered. And of course, every time you're spreading uh, importance, the the state is is being updated, and the the ECAN equations in the OpenCog system, you know, basically they're a heuristic for exercising this this particular discrete decision system, and we'll we'll see some more intricate and advanced examples of, of this soon. I mean, one example of which is discrete decision systems that do function optimization. And there's a process I call uh, COFO, combinatory operation-based function optimization. So when I was talking about the theory of pattern in an earlier uh, video in this series, I introduced what I called the combinatory computational model where you have uh, a bunch of different elements that combine with each other to form new elements, sort of like in a, in a, in a chemical computational model. And I, I was talking about that then as, as part of the infrastructure for defining what a, what a pattern is. Well, you can, you can also look at this as an approach to function opposition, optimization. So you have a bunch of elements that form into combinations, which then form into larger combinations. And each of those combinations of elements can form an argument to some objective function that you're, you're trying to optimize, right? So then in that case, optimizing an objective function is a matter of exploring the space of combinations to find the combination of elements that will say maximize the objective function. And so if you're, uh, if you're looking at it that way, then you can, you can view function optimization as a discrete decision process, right? So the, the decision to make is how to combine the elements you have into a new combination forming a new argument for evaluation by the by the objective function and the I mean the uh, the reward is how much information did you gain through that function evaluation about where the maximum of the of the objective function is and so you 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 you, you can then iterate this discrete decision process over and over again right I mean your 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 state is basically everything you know about the objective function that, that you, you're, you're trying to maximize, all the, all the, uh, all the argument values that, that, you, that you've evaluated so far, and which is the knowledge you have about the function. Your action is, well, making a new combination of, of elements and trying out that combination in the, in the objective function. The reward is how much information about maximizing the objective function did you gain from that evaluation, the new state is then your state of knowledge, in, including the function, the objective function evaluated on the combination you've, you've just fed it, right? So this, this is a discrete decision process that's carrying out function optimization. Again, this is really, really basic and generic, and there's nothing too fancy here, but this is, a, it's a sort of general formalism 
that can be useful to wrap up a lot of of different practical useful AI AI algorithms. And yeah, here this this slide goes through the COFO process as a discrete decision system in in more detail. The intricacy here really is in what's able to step two, like how do you form a new combination? Well, you can you can sample the available entities and combinatory operators and from some probabilistic sampling over possible combinations you could form from your existing knowledge, you, you get something new. Or so you could do reasoning of some sort to guess which combination you want to try out in the objective function. Then you ask, well, how does this reasoning process work? The reasoning process may itself be a discrete decision system. The reasoning process may itself be another, another COFO process, right? And then you have a recursive DDS in the form of a recursive COFO process. And now we're getting further and further into sort of the high level nature of how how I think uh, generally intelligent systems can be can be built at a very abstract level, not yet talking about what the specific cognitive algorithms in, in, in question are. And at this very abstract level, we can also view what we're doing as a sort of probabilistic programming, right? Because uh, where we where we sample combinations of elements probabilistically based on our prior knowledge of which combinations you know gave a high value to the objective function which ones gave a low value when we sample combinations to evaluate i mean that's in essence what probabilistic programming is is doing and i mean you can you can cash out the the math here in a, in a way that makes clear that this is this is a kind of probabilistic programming i mean it it winds up not playing nicely with the distributional assumptions that are made in most of the probabilistic programming literature and like the simple toy examples that are normally used in the probabilistic programming field. But conceptually and formally, it's probabilistic programming and, and this, this becomes interesting. Uh, this diagram sort of summarizes the recursive nature of this process. I mean, you have a discrete decision system but then uh, in choosing what action to take, you know, the system is sort of updating a knowledge model based on asking other, other discrete decision systems to, 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 to do something. And this, uh, it's all within the formalism of the, of the DDS, right? But, uh, but making it, recursive certainly adds an additional dimension to it. And so far, this doesn't have anything to do with any particular knowledge representation. It's just very abstract about optimizing functions and, and taking actions. I'm going to look at, at this sort of process from here on, mostly in the context of metagraphs. And I, I've explained in an earlier video how you can sort of build up to the metagraph knowledge structure out of very basic things like distinctions and, and, and observations. So in general, we can look at metagraphs in two different ways. So you can look at it sort of as I was doing in the uh, earlier video in the series on, on uh, fundamental ontology, right? You can look at a metagraph as a basic means of analyzing what a mind is doing from a conceptual and phenomenological perspective. But you can also look at a metagraph as a core data structure. I mean, so if you have an AGI system that's made say of, you know, a quark gluon plasma or, the, or, the, or that's made of a DNA computer or, or a quantum computer or a relational database or whatever weird thing you want, you could still, model that mind using distinction metagraphs, right? The metagraph is, is still an interesting meta level model of that cognitive system. On, on, on the other hand, 
know, it's also interesting just to use the metagraph as the explicit knowledge representation of, of, of an AGI system. And I mean, that's convenient in terms of, you know, modern math and computer science, which lets you do graphs for a lot of interesting things and technologies like graph databases. It also gives you a system that has a elegant and simple way to do self-reflection and self-modification because metagraphs are a nice way to do a high level model of what a system is doing. But if the system's knowledge representation is metagraphs, that means it's very easy for the system to make a high level model of itself within its native representational language. I mean, certainly metagraph based knowledge representations are not the only way to make systems that are capable of advanced reflection and, and self-reference, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an especially convenient way. So in the next slides, I'm going to go through some figures and ideas from the paper uh, Folding and Unfolding on Metagraphs that uh, I posted on Archive not that, not that long ago. And the paper goes through more, more of the associated formalism. So this, this shows an edge, which you could also call a hyper edge in a directed type metagraph. So the big label T in the middle is it's not a node, it, it's just a label on the edge saying what, what, T is the type of this edge and this edge has four targets, right? And so then each of the uh, targets of this edge has, has a certain uh, type associated with it. And uh, you see, and there, there's a certain ordering also. So we have like, target one should match, has type T1, target two has type T2. There are two targets which are in the third position and one has type T3, one has type T4. So the one, two, three is an ordering of targets, but there are two targets in, in, in position three. So this is a sort of fairly simple random example of a hyper edge with the type of the edge and types to the targets and ordering among some of the edges, but not all of them. So to take it, to make a directed type metagraph, you're taking a bunch of edges like this and then unlinking them all together. And of course, a simple binary edge like you have in an ordinary graph is a special, special case of this. And you can, in some cases and for some purposes, you could take a hyper edge like this. You could say some of the targets we're gonna call input, some are outputs and some are just uh, internal, they're, they're, they're lateral connections. And if, if you want to look at flows through a metagraph, then it makes sense to take a given edge and look at well, where's the input and, where, and where's the output of a particular process that, that's flowing through the metagraph. And, and uh, a, a path through a directed type metagraph, I call a, a meta path, right? And a meta path you get by by connecting outputs of some hyper edges to inputs of some other hyper edges in a way where the types match up, like a, a type one edge maps a type one edge and, 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 so, and so forth. And uh, here we see a type two target is mapping a type six target. And we have a compatibility relation between type two and, and, and type six. So you, you can have different types match as long as the, the type system says they can match, right? And so then you need some uh, type inheritance and, and, and type inference. And, you know, these types could be abstract dependent types. They, they, could, they could be simple labels. You could do a lot of things with this, this type of, of formalism. So one one interesting way to look at this sort of directed type metagraph is to create some constructors. And you can, you can identify a few basic constructors that you could build any such metagraph out of. So there's the beside constructor, which is just like parallel composition. You're putting two, putting two metagraphs, in this case, two single hyper edges, just putting them next to each other. Then the input to the combined system is just uh, you know, the composition of the in inputs of the, of the two systems. 
connect constructor, you're plugging uh, outputs of one guy into inputs of another. So this is serial connection. You're, you're, you're chaining, you're chaining sub metagraphs or in this simple case, hyper edges together. Then swap is a little more interesting and, and, and subtle one. Basically you're swapping the, the ordering of, of two edges. And of course you can swap the ordering of two edges. That means you could permute the ordering of, of N edges. So it, it turns out that to beside connect and, and, and swap, like parallel positioning, serial chaining, and then repermutation of ordering, using these three operators, you can basically build up any arbitrarily com com complex uh, directed typed metagraph. If you want to build undirected type metagraphs, you could do that using the same way. There's also simpler sets of operators you can use for undirected typed m metagraphs. If, if, you, if you have a case where the inputs and outputs aren't important, now you, you, you can look in the paper for this. So, so this, this all gives you the basis to do some interesting metagraph mathematics, right? So for example, you can, you can make a topology where the open sets are the, are the meta paths. And I mean, if you if you have a, an if you have a typed metagraph without direction on it, and you have a bunch of different directed typed metagraphs that are sort of layered on on top of that undirected typed metagraph, so say a bunch of different flows on the same type metagraph, where each flow is in a, is in a directed type metagraph. That give that you can also define a, a metagraph topology on this sort of forest of directed type metagraphs that's built up on a single undirected typed metagraph. And so having having a topology is useful for a lot of reasons. Among other things, this topology gives you uh, it gives you the ability to build up a, a, a probability theory and an intuitionistic logic. So every topology induces a hating algebra and, and the hating algebra gives you an, an intuitionistic logic, which gives you intuitionistic probabilities. So by, by looking at meta paths and sub meta paths, and then the union intersection of meta paths, I mean, you, you can, you can build up uh, whole logic and, and probability here. I alluded to this earlier in in the in the paper on uh, folding and folding on metagraphs. So I, I elaborate on this in more detail. So the next step I want to take you're getting even closer toward algorithmics, and I want to talk about various kinds of morphisms over these. Metagraph. So we have topologies, we have flows, we have algebras, and we also want to execute algorithms over these metagraphs in a way that work nicely with these topologies and, and these, these algorithms. And it turns out that a lot of cognitively relevant algorithms that you might want to use to make a metagraph based AGI system under some moderately, usually kind of realistic assumptions, a lot of cognitively relevant algorithms can be implemented in terms of various kinds of fold and unfold operations over metagraphs. And I think this is actually a fairly important observation for making scalable metagraph-based AGI systems on current current computing infrastructures. So I'm not going to have time to give a full like functional programming lesson here, but I'm, I'm going to try to maybe stimulate the memories of uh, anyone listening who has, has dealt with fold and unfold before, but it, it, was a little, it was a little fuzzy in their recollection. So, I mean, if you've programmed Haskell or other functional programming languages, you will have used fold a lot, right? So I mean, the, this this shows uh, this slide shows folding 
over a list, which is the most common and, and, and simple kind of fold. So if you say fold right to FZ, what, what, what you're doing is you're using Z as the, as the iteration, as the initial point of the iteration. And then you're, you're folding F over each element of the list. So we have, we have this list one, two, three, four, five, and then we're applying fold right FZ to that list. And that involves putting Z in the initial seed position and then applying F in between each, each element of the, of the list. And you can do that on the left as well. And if this, if this is total meaningless voodoo to you, like just look up the Wikipedia article on, on Haskell fold, look up some Haskell tutorials. If you know a little programming or computer science, it's, it's, not, it's not very hard. You have tree-like fold as well, which is interesting, like a fold tree. So then you can sort of imagine instead of just folding over the list, you're folding over all the no all the nodes in the in inside the the tree. And this gets closer and closer to what we need for, for AGI, right? So you can you can represent, for example, merge sort or a merge sort with duplicates removal incredibly elegantly using using a tree fold right you're just folding the merge operator through through the whole tree it, it's 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 quite beautiful i mean you can you can find prime numbers in a in a in a couple lines as 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 we see here i mean this is a it's really a prime example of how elegant and and pretty functional programming can be and I mean, fold as an operator in itself, it, it generates all primitive recursive functions, like all functions that can be built up by composition from elementary functions. So folding is a very, very powerful thing. I mean, you know, the human mind obviously can conceive functions that are not primitive recursive. On the other hand, pretty much everything we need to do in our everyday life clearly has to do with primitive recursive functions, functions that can be built up by, you know, recursive composition from other functions. And so it, it's interesting and I think important that fold is in a very straightforward way, universal among, among primitive recursive functions. I mean, that's, that's not just a sort of freaky mathematical fact it actually connects with why folding unfolding in various forms are so useful for implementing cognitive algorithms against large metagraphs and building real agi systems which is uh, you know critical as i'll elaborate later in this video series it, it, it's critical to what we're doing with, with open cog hyperon now for example opposite of folding is unfolding. So a, a fancy word for folding is catamorphism. Then the fancy word for the reverse for unfolding is 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 anamorphism, right? So when, when you fold something over a list, you're starting with a seed, then you're applying that same operator at each position in the list and you get out of it some sort of some some output, which could be a, another list or could be an atomic element, right? Anamorphism is the opposite. You're building, you're building something up. So I mean, if you unfold, say for a list, you could start with an element. Then in each step of unfolding, you're extending the list longer and longer. If you're you're unfolding a tree, you're unfold, you're starting with a seed. Then you're applying some function to the seed to get something bigger. Then you're applying some function to each node in that bigger tree to get something bigger. And you're, you're gradually growing, growing a tree. You're incrementally building building a structure, right? And uh, this is more than I wanna go into a lot here, but if you if you follow the links here, you can express fold and unfold, catamorphism and anamorphism very elegantly in terms of uh, functors from category theory, you have some, some really nice uh, functional code and the blog posts I'm linking to are really well worth reading through to get an idea of 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 how all this works. I mean, I think the the categorical formulation makes very clear what's 
what's going on here. And an example from the same blog is treeification. So this is an anamorphism that takes a list and then unfolds the list into a tree, right? It unfolds, it, it builds the tree out of out of the list in a in a, in a in a very very simple way. So you take the list one two three four five, and then it builds this this nice tree one two three four five out of it in a, in an in an automated way. So there's there's a lot of kinds of uh, morphisms, and I, I think. Uh, you know, functional programming geeks like to make up weird names for these morphisms just because, uh, you know, it's 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 a way that those of us with a severe Asperger's syndrome like like to get our jollies, right? I, I mean, the, these uh, words may not be all entirely necessary. There might be some simpler and more systematic way to define these things, but but what 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 the heck, right? So. Catamism is a word for fold and morphism for unfold. Hylomorphism is where you unfold and then fold. And, and there's a whole bunch of beautiful theorems in the functional programming literature showing how this basically lets lets you do do anything. Like you can you can get any any Turing computable algorithm by various sorts of unfolding and then folding hyl hylomorphisms and Metamorphism, you fold and then unfold, or often you fold, you do some other operation and then and then you unfold. Now where things start to get more AGI-ish and more specifically relevant to OpenCog Hyperon is with these histomorphism and futomorphism. So a histomorphism, you're folding, but the the fold operation at each step retains the memory of everything that, that it did in, in the fold operation so far. And the future morphism, similarly, you're unfolding. And each step of the building, the unfolding process, the, the unfolding function has ready access to the memory of everything it, it's, it's, it has unfolded so far. So say when you're when you're unfolding and building some node of a tree, the function that's building a certain node of a tree potentially knows all the nodes that have been built so far and all, and all the rest of the tree. And uh, chronomorphism is, is basically a hylomorphism that carries through memory. So it's unfold and fold with memory. So it's a future morphism, then a histomorphism, metachronomorphism, is a fold then unfold, which carries memory through. So I mean, this uh, these names are kind of silly, but uh, the concepts are not at all silly. They're they're very nice mathematics, and and we'll see that when you try to find efficient implementations of some of the key cognitive algorithms that seem to underlie you know, human-like thinking, what we what we come up with when we look for efficient ways to implement these things are exactly these uh, funky chronomorphisms and, and, and metachronomorphisms. So in the folding and unfolding and metagraphs paper, I I go through some fairly simple mathematics explaining how you fold and unfold on metagraphs, which as far as I know, it's straightforward, but it hasn't been elaborated so far. I mean, fold and unfold on lists and on trees has been has been elaborated, and I found some papers folding and folding on graphs, but folding and folding on metagraphs hasn't been elaborated. It's kind of along along the same lines. You have to work the formalism a little a little a little differently. But I mean, if you look at the serial and parallel constructor operators the, the, the like beside and connect operators that you you can combine to build up metagraphs from from hyper edges and and for and for paths i mean basically a fold operation comes out to a function that that maps your 
metagraph in, into something in a way that morphically maps the beside and connect constructors into the the action of some other uh, operators on the on the range of the fold function. So you can, you know, the the equations here are more elegant than the words used to to describe them. And I, I urge you to look at the paper. But the 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 morphism aspect of the fold catamorphism should be pretty clear here, right? Like you have f of you know x beside y is maps morphically into f of x then combined by the circle plus operator with with with, with f of y right so you're you're taking the metagraph combination and you're you're mapping it morphically into into a combination of the the values you'd get by mapping each element of the metagraph combination and Anamorphism is just the opposite, right? I mean, you're you're unfolding, you're 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 taking some combination of, of values x and y, and then you're you're mapping that morphically into a metagraph that could be represented as the the combination by the appropriate operator of of the the unfold operator applied to X and the unfold operator applied to applied to Y. And we can look at hylomorphisms and metamorphisms in a in a straightforward way here as well. I mean a metagraph hylomorphism, you take a metagraph anamorphism, metagraph catamorphism and and, and combine them and the uh, you can dig this computer science uh, pretty deep. I mean, you can you can look at uh, what are the what are the conditions under which you can do these in in real time, step by step, sort of streaming these folds and unfolds rather than rather than doing them in 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 batch mode. And then you can look at you can look at history, right? So the the history of a metagraph folder unfold operation conveniently is itself representable in the metagraph. And you can make what I call a history hypertree that keeps a record of what the fold or unfold operator did. And then the, the fold and unfold operator has to pass this history hypertree through what it does step after step. And in that way you can build up histomorphisms and, and, and uh, and future morphisms. And the, the morphism math looks about the same, but you're passing these history hypertrees around. So if you have an element X, its history hypertree is HX, and you're you're passing these around through the through the the morphisms and uh, I encourage you to look in look in the in the paper for all, all the details. But the typed metagraph or directed type metagraph chronomorphism and metachronomorphism, I believe are going to be critical to scalable implementation of cognitive algorithms that are relevant to human-like general intelligence. I mean, these sorts of morphisms are not used that much in the functional programming world, but I mean, people aren't that often trying to build AGI systems using functional programming languages. If if they were, they would be a, they would they would they would be using these things because you're you're folding and unfolding, or you're unfolding and then folding, and of course, you want to use the memory you're accumulating in this process to do to do each step better 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 and better, and that's. Uh, you know that you can do on a single metagraph, or as I said before, you can take a typed metagraph and you can look at multiple directed type metagraphs defined by defining certain directional flows over the type metagraph. Then you get what I call a forested type metagraph, where the, the forest is the DTMGs, directed type metagraphs, layered over the same basic type metagraph.
and I mean, you can you can fold and unfold over over these things as 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 well. The other thing you need to do to make this formalism work nicely is you can you want to sort of think about the actual realized knowledge metagraph of your AGS system, like the actual nodes nodes and links, sing and RAM and disk. You want to think about that as a sort of realized metagraph, which is a portion of a larger virtual metagraph. And much of the virtual metagraph exists only in conceptual mathematical space, but it's useful to think of it as existing in, in some sense, right? So like when you're creating a new edge in your knowledge base, what you're, what you're really doing is, uh, I mean, you're pulling new edges from the, the larger virtual metagraph into, into the realized metagraph. And uh, similarly, when, when, you, when you forget something, it's not there in the realized metagraph, it's still in the broader virtual metagraph. When you update, you know, a weight or a label on, the, on an edge, what you're doing is you're, you're sort of forgetting the previous version with the previous weight or label and you're replacing it. You're pulling out a new edge with a new weight or label from the, from the virtual metagraph and taking this sort of formalism you know, it's very agreeable in an abstract platonic philosophical way. It also makes the math work out nicely. And you can, again, get topological here. You can look at like, in, in, in what case are these, all these morphisms, in, 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 in what case are they continuous in the, topology on the, on the metagraph and in, in, in the metapath topology and if you if you make some reasonable assumptions like the the operators defining the the fold and unfold operators are continuous in the metapath topology then then the morphisms themselves will be will be continuous and so all that all that is a lot but it's just building up to the main course right so that the main the main course in this video is really an application of ideas from this uh, paper by Mu and Oliveira, Programming from Galois Connections, applications of this paper to discrete decision systems, and in, in, in particular to COFO discrete decision systems that do function optimization, among others. We're going to apply the ideas from this paper on programming from Galois connections to these discrete decision systems for function optimization in a way that transforms the discrete decision systems into fold and unfold operations with with memory. And I'm gonna I'm gonna argue that this applies to things like logical theorem pro proving and you know evolutionary program learning and, and clustering to like practical practical algorithms that are critical for building real world AGI systems and are used now in in, in OpenCog and, and, and other 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 software systems. So this is a you know this is moderately abstract math, but actually it's it's a great concretization and simplification of some much more abstract math developed by Bird and uh, Demore and other of these, you know, classic functional programming theorists from, from the last few decades. So a lot of what I'm doing here is taking some choice bits and pieces from the, uh, the functional programming literature, which has been around a while and underlying the, you know, the theory behind Haskell and other functional programming languages. I'm taking some some choice bits from this functional programming theory and I'm applying them to AI algorithms that seem to be important to, to creating general intelligence. And in the functional programming literature, these have typically been applied to you know other, other sorts of algorithms, not not so much to, to AI and, and, and AGI. So 
concept of a Galois connection. Again, I'm not going to give a whole tutorial here. You can you can look up online what's a what's a Galois connection. It's not not that tricky of an idea. Basically, if you have two free orders, which I write by a pointy and a and a square uh, less than symbol here. The Galois connection is two adjoint functions that are, are related in, in according to the equations show, shown on the slide, like F, Fz is pointy less than x is equivalent to z is square less than gx, right? So F and G have a certain duality between them, having, having F on on one side of one ordering is the same as having G on the other side of the other ordering, right? And so you can, the relation between multiplication and and division works works out this way, right? Like if F is times, then G is divides. And in that, in that case, it's the same ordering operator, right? It's just real number less than but there are interesting cases where it's where it's a different ordering operation on the on the two sides and the the application of this in computer science and in ai is largely cases where one of these functions is easier to compute than the other so like in this simple example multiplication is easier to compute than division so i mean if you take a division problem and recast it as a multiplication problem you may be achieving a, a computational, a calculational simplification. So in, in much more abstract cases than multiplication and division, you still have a situation where a Galois connection can be used to drive automatic derivation of methods to evaluate the harder adjunct function by means of the by means of the of the easier one. And so in their paper, Mu and Oliveira, they explain how you can take greedy algorithms and dynamic programming type algorithms as two examples. And you can e express these using Galois connections and then use Galois connections to help derive efficient algorithms to execute the greedy and dynamic programming processes. And, this builds on earlier work by Bird and Jamor using, using more abstract functional transformations to do with gradient and dynamic programming algorithms. Now, the key observation I'm making here is that the bulk of the cognitive algorithms useful in AGI systems can be expressed within some often reasonable assumptions as either greedy algorithms or approximate stochastic dynamic programming algorithms, right? And so that that lets us use some of this theory on cognitive algorithms that are are relevant to AI. And then by by following Mu and Oliveira's theory through in the in these cases, what the conclusion we come to is that you can derive algorithms for relatively efficiently implementing these cognitive processes using chronomorphisms over metagraphs. And then if you have a language where metagraph chronomorphisms are reasonably efficiently implementable, I mean, then you have something interesting in terms of practical realization of, of AI algorithms. So. Greedy optimization is one, one example here. And I mean, we can take this fairly ab ab abstractly, right? So I mean, the idea of greedy optimization is steepest ascent like, although it goes beyond steepest ascent, like you're trying to maximize a function, you have one value, you evaluate it, you, you then look at other values near that value, find which one maximizes the function best, take that as your next guess. Look at other things near that guess, find which one maximizes the function best, take that as your next guess. So step by step, you're taking whatever looks best locally and 
assuming maybe it's best and taking it as your next next provisional assumption you know just uh, like climbing a mountain by following whatever direction is is steepest in your immediate vicinity like you need to do if you're climbing a mountain in a in a deep fog and can't see the overall landscape and evolutionary learning genetic algorithms genetic programming and so forth can actually be viewed in in this way also if you look at the guess as a population right and then ev evolution is trying to move that population to the fittest population that's near to the current population then trying trying to move that new population to the fittest population that's near to that new population and 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 so forth so evolution can be viewed as greedy on the population level and that that's an example of how the notion of greedy optimization is is fairly broad because evolutionary learning can be doing some fancy things like not just mutation but crossover and probabilistic population modeling and so forth you can still often view it as as greedy on the on the population level so greedy optimization algorithms over metagraphs or or elsewhere can can be viewed as folding and this sort of half moon notation you see in this slide this half moonish parentheses means uh although it's not a half moon it's a, it's a little slice of a moon but these these moon slice like parentheses are a notation for folding this uh, harpoon type operator is introduced by Mu and Olivera and means shrinking and it, it's defined as we see here as shrunk by R means as is intersection with the R mod the converse of, of S where the converse of S is just S as a relation flipped in 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 order so we've got we've got some fairly concise notation here I mean I I had to stare at this shit quite a long time before it became natural to me to, to to be honest there were hours spent like staring at equations in Mu and Oliver and Bird and Demore like trying to trying to get a clear mental image of what this abstract stuff means I mean I'm reasonably good at this stuff but it, it's just hard you got you gotta really focus to get your human brain to to wrap itself around this stuff it's it's not it's not immediate for any anybody I don't I don't, I don't think but uh, what this theorem shows is is that so the left the left hand side where shrinking s over r and and the, then we're we're folding that over our knowledge base so s s is the operation that is suggesting which values to evaluate in the function you're trying to optimize and r is the function evaluation operator so you're you're basically shrinking the search process to find which values to evaluate into the evaluation process and then you're you're folding this process of searching and then evaluating over over over, over the whole knowledge base the whole metagraph for example what this theorem says is that this this implies the right hand side which is folding the search process over the whole knowledge base and then shrinking it into the evaluation process so to try to simplify this a bit what you're doing on the on the left hand side is you're step by step going over the whole knowledge base so the whole metagraph you step by step going over the whole metagraph and at at each point you're doing some local search and then evaluation then you're moving to the next point doing local search and evaluation and you're in the next point you're doing the local search and evaluation 
That's what's happening on the on the left side. You're folding local search and evaluation over the whole knowledge base. What's happening on the on the right side is that you're doing your search algorithm first over everything, and then you're doing evaluation sort of as a as a separate batch over 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 all the things you've you've searched and and found. Because on the right hand side, the folding is only for search. You're not folding the evaluation. And what what this says is it's okay to fold the evaluation too, basically. And that's nice. That 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 gives more efficient algorithms to do things. Now this, I mean this theorem, you know, it has this monotonicity condition, which in terms of optimization means that this will really only work rigorously if you're optimizing a convex function where greedy algorithms actually work, like C percent will bring you to the to the global opt, op, optimum. And I mean that that's that's not a surprise, right? I mean that's always a limitation of, of, of greedy methods that really only be optimal for a convex function or within a convex region of a of a of a the fitness landscape of a of a non-convex function. But if you if you're using a greedy algorithm anyway, this shows that that in a local sense you can implement it by by folding, which is is interesting. And say if you're looking at an evolutionary algorithm, this would give you the liberty to carry out your evolutionary operators locally through the through through the metagraph rather rather than doing evolution all at once across a, a, whole, a whole metagraph. I mean that, that, that's quite important. Dynamic programming here we're looking at theorem two from Moon Oliver and this is this is even a little bit trickier, right? So what we have on the right hand side here with these these uh, angle brackets just denotes the least fixed point of, of, of a certain function. And the, so this, if you know how dynamic programming works, the, the least fixed point is sort of the, that, that's the way you solve the, 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 the Bellman equation that, that summarizes the dynamic programming problem. So the prototypical dynamic programming problem is say, finding the shortest path in a, in a network. So like you, you have a graph for a network and you want to find the shortest path from one point to another. Dynamic programming does it, you know, in a way that's not that fast, but at least it's not wasteful. Like you, 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 you're trying to find a path from here to here. You start from your initial point. You look at every, every place you could get from that initial point. Then from each of those places, you look at every place you could you could get you could get from there, and so it's sort of a complete enumeration. But the thing is, you're keeping memory of all the subpaths that you've evaluated. So if if in exploring a path that goes in a certain direction, you encounter some subpath, if you encounter that subpath again when starting from some other direction, you don't. You don't recalculate its its length. You 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 you, you don't revisit uh, what what you what you've done before. So, dynamic programming it's a reasonably efficient algorithm for solving that sort of problem. Now you can look at approximate dynamic programming or stochastic dynamic programming, where in the shortest path through a graph example, you're just you're sampling possible paths from the the beginning to the end and trying to use some judicious heuristic method to figure out which which potential paths to to actually actually sample right so that there's an equation called the bellman equation which uh the fixed point of of, of which tells you the optimal optimal solution right so in to the 
to the problem that you're solving by dynamic programming in, in, in the example, finding the shortest path through, through, through a graph. And uh, the dynamic programming algorithm that's normally followed, which is a form of discrete decision system, DDS, as, as, as I described before. So executing a DDS to solve the dynamic programming problem, that's basically a way of finding the fixed point of the, 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 Bell, the Bellman equation, of solving the, the Bellman equation. So what we have on the, on the right-hand side here, we have uh, the fixed point of this equation. And then what, what you have on the, on the left-hand side is some simpler folding, right? So, I mean, here you're, you're folding your search operator, then uh, you're folding this operator T that decomposes the input into, into sub-problems. And then the combination of these folding operations, you're, you're shrinking into the evaluation function R. So basically on the right-hand side, you have something hard, which is solving this fixed point equation to find the, to find the uh, optimal solution to some dynamic programming problem. Then on the left-hand side, you have something that's more concrete. It doesn't involve mysteriously finding a least fixed point. It just involves folding a couple of things over the knowledge structure, say knowledge metagraph, combining and then and then shrinking them. And you know, this takes some scrutiny. You gotta read Mu et al paper and then and then then read my paper patterns of cognition, wrap your brain around all this. But this is a highly abstract way of unraveling some fairly hairy cognitive algorithms into you know compositions of of fold operators and i think i think that's uh, again pretty interesting and important in terms of practical implementation of of agi algorithms on 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 large large knowledge bases. Now, you know, if you are solving the fixed point equation only approximately, then that that gives you some liberty to do the things on the left side, like the search process S only approximately also, right? And so, so this, uh, what's happening on the left side is Combining, if 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 you're applying this to an optimization process that's combining a bunch of elements to try to find which combination will optimize the the, the objective function, then basically the S and T part on the left hand side is doing a lot of combining. Then the the R part is evaluating the the objective function according to what according to what is is combined and so what you can see when you sift through all this you can see if you have a combinatory function optimization decision process and the combination operators are mutually associative so you're trying to find a combination of elements that will optimize a function and the operators by which you're combining the elements are, are associative, meaning that it doesn't matter what order you group them in parenthetically, then you can implement this as a, as a chronomorphism. So as a composition of folding and unfolding where memory is, is passed through the folding and, and unfolding processes. And this becomes pretty interesting from a, an AGI standpoint. I mean, you can ask, for example, what if, what if your combinatory operators are logical inference rules and the elements being combined are observations and logical premises, right? So the entities you're combining are observations and logic rules. Uh, are the entities you're combining are observations and pieces of knowledge? The combinatory operators are, are knowledge rules. Then 
you're trying to find a combination of your observations and knowledge, meaning a logical derivation according to the rules that maximizes some objective function, say, such as that comes up with the, uh, you know, the maximum utility action that, that you should take next. So in that sort of setting, when does associativity hold? Well, what comes out is associativity holds among operators that are logic rules. For example, if the logic rules are reversible, like if you have A implies B implies is not associative. If you have A and B imply each other co-implication that is associative, which is interesting, right? It means that reversible logic is associative. So if you're trying to achieve something like, like coming up with maximal utility actions using logical theorem proving, you can make that an associative operation combination matter by using co-implications, bi-directional implications rather than one-directional implications. And then you can do your logic via folding. You can, you can do your logic as, as, as a chronomorphism over your, your knowledge metagraph. So one lesson here is do reversible logic, then under some reasonable assumptions, you can do logic by folding, which is a potentially interestingly scalable way to do logic. And, and for program execution, the similar lesson is you want to be doing reversible computing, right? So if, if executing a program can be undone to get the inputs back back from the outputs, right? That, that, then the, you're sort of rearranging your inputs into the outputs and you can you can get that to be associative in a way that you can't get ordinary uh, program execution to be associative. And so the, the, this is a quite cool to me, quite interesting and really tells you something about how you want to arrange say program learning and logical reasoning systems to allow efficient implementation in terms of, of of folding and unfolding. Now, this is cool. It's sort of, it's not, it's not infinitely cool because to apply these theorems to a knowledge metagraph, you sort of have to assume the knowledge metagraph is not changing as you fold and unfold over it. And that's not quite accurate. I mean, as you, as you fold and unfold over a large knowledge metagraph, the operators you're folding and unfolding over are going to update that knowledge metagraph, right? And so it's changing, which means these, these theorems only apply in an approximative sense. Still, it's a decent approximation, right? I mean, most thought processes you carry about across your whole knowledge base, you're modifying your fundamental knowledge base only, only in a fairly modest way as, as, as you draw whatever conclusions you're, you're drawing or, or choose whatever action, actions you're choosing. So I, I think, uh, yes, all this is only approximative, but on the other hand, you know, human thinking is also highly approximative and finding out decent approximations that yield to scalable implementations is an, an extremely important thing to be doing. So yeah, that that summarizes a bunch of uh, computer science -y material. And in the in the paper patterns of cognition, I go over more examples. So I talk, I talked about uh, I talked here about logical inference, a little about program learning and, and execution and a little bit about uh, activation spreading, ECAN. So I talk about pattern mining and agglomerate of clustering and, and a couple other cognitive algorithms in the paper patterns of cognition. And I explore how those also could be 
implemented as either greedy or stochastic approximate dynamic programming and so that those therefore could also be represented approximately as metagraph chronomorphisms and I, I think I think this all tells you something right I'll talk about more of this in the context of OpenCog Hyper on uh, uh, a little bit later in this in this video series but I mean I think it it tells you that if you make a huge distributed knowledge metagraph and you make efficient ways to do chronomorphisms and metachronomorphisms across this distributed knowledge metagraph, then this is going to give you a way to approximately do some pretty advanced cognition against this huge knowledge metagraph. And you may need to set some things up, right? Like set up your logic to do by implications and, 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 and so forth. But, but it, it, it can work. And I think that's, uh, that's really quite intriguing. And I mean, so, I mean, if we, if we go back to things like AXE or, or, or Gordel machine, I mean, these are discrete decision systems, which are choosing actions, trying to optimize rewards step by step, but their methods of choosing actions are insanely overexpensive, like searching through the space of all possible programs or, or, or you know, finding a, finding a proof of which, which action will be, will be best by, you know, somehow logically comparing it to every other, every other possible action. So we're, we're sort of following a similar format here, but in the approach I've, I've described here, we, we in, in, in this uh, video, we're replacing the search over all possible programs or the comprehensively precise theorem proving. We're replacing it with a sort of more judicious statistical sampling over possible programs and, and with probabilistic proofs that that aren't necessarily finding the best action but they're just finding finding a, a a good action right and so we're we're looking at this heuristic sampling aspect as as, as a, a matter of sampling combinations of basic elements and of then recursively using various discrete decision systems to do inference about which combinations of basic elements may be most most appropriate to to explore. And if uh, if we go back to the lecture on foundational ontology that was earlier in this series, what we're seeing is that many of the ideas that I explored there, like distinction metagraphs and a combinational computational model, many of the many of these ideas that I explored there in order to sort of clarify what is a pattern or how might we describe a mind and its observations and their relationship to each other. A bunch of these core mathematical and conceptual structures, they're, they're popping up here as fundamental ways to frame rough approximations to infeasible universal AI algorithms. And I think, I think all this takes us a fair way toward building thinking machines. It takes us a fair way toward the OpenCog Hyperon architecture. It doesn't quite take us all the way. And uh, in the next lecture, I'll explain what takes us the rest of the way, which is looking a bit more closely at human cognitive architecture and uh, what, what I will call uh, critical priors for human-like and uh, human-friendly general intelligence. That's all for now.